In these perilous times, see from current events how biblical prophecy is coming to pass in front of our eyes. You're watching In the Last Days, the program that looks at Israel and the end times with teaching from a Hebraic perspective. With Martin and Natalie Blackham, thank you to our friends and partners who make this program possible. Now, here's Martin and Natalie. Shalom dear friends, welcome from Zion, from Jerusalem and from the mountain of Haradar. It's wonderful to be able to be with you today and I have the joy again to uh, have Rabbi Shmuel Bowman. He comes from Canada and he made Aliyah when he was uh, in 1993 and he became a sofer or started to do the, the work of a sofer which is a scribe in 1997. This is quite interesting because we started with Martin digging in our Jewish roots just at that, just the beginning in 1997. Wow. So it's like there is a big movement for discovering and knowing the beauty of the Hebrew language. So yes. this is Rabbi Shmuel. Thank you for coming oh. from Efrat. It's good uh, to be here. Good to be back. Good. Good to be at Haradar. Good. Thank you. Good. Good. Let us start with what you have in, on your heart today to um, okay, okay. To share. You know, we've been talking about the um, the Hebrew alphabet, the alphabet of the Hebrew language. We've been talking about the idea that Hebrew, if you, if we we want to search, we want to get back to our our biblical roots. I think this is the journey you've mm -hmm. been taking. I've been taking. Mm -hmm. Jews are taking this 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 journey. Christians are taking this journey. In order to do that, there's no way around it. We have to go to the Hebrew. We have to go to the Hebrew. I uh, agree. I grew up speaking English, a little bit of French, and, um, and you know, there's so many languages in the world. The moment you translate something, you lose something. Mm -hmm. You lose uh, not only the exact definition, mm -hmm. you're also going to lose something behind the definition. And I'd even call that the wisdom. Mm -hmm. And the Hebrew language, thanks to all sorts of wonderful uh, technology, uh, thanks to your book that, you've, uh, that you need to tell us about, uh, thanks to many resources, uh, Hebrew is accessible. And I encourage everybody to make an effort and try and dig in just a little bit more into the Hebrew language, because I that, you agree? I you agree. agree. <laughs> you might. Totally. I, I want to give you an example today, and, and this example for me is is a life lesson and uh, and if anybody is watching this and feels the same way then then blessings to you because I think and and, and welcome to a great journey mm -hmm. we just a couple months ago during the festival of Purim we read the scroll of Esther and again if anybody has not become familiar with the scroll of Esther read the scroll of Esther it's available in every language it's a powerful story. It's not a long story. Um, and in my case, I'm spending my entire life just digging into the story of Esther. And of course, as a Torah scribe, it really is my favorite thing to actually write. It's a powerful story. And one of the things that's going on in, in Esther, and if you, if you uh, have a Bible, you can refer to this in uh, Esther. And I'm looking specifically in chapter 3, verse 1. Chapter 3, verse 1 of the book of Esther. We've already, until this point, been introduced to the idea of who is this king, Ahasuerus. That's the Hebrew. Some in other languages say Xerxes, some Asestesis. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm going to say it in the Hebrew. A lot of English people speak about it. Let's do it in the Hebrew. His name is Ahasuerus. And we learn a little bit about him, and he's the, really he's, he's the most powerful man in the world at that time and quite, a, quite an individual. We've also been introduced to Mordechai, mm -hmm. who is a Jew. He's actually from the tribe of Benjamin. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And he's very much the leader of the Jews in exile, because the Jews are in exile at this point in time. They've been exiled from Israel, and they're in Persia, modern-day Iran. Yes. Chapter 3, verse 1. After these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, as we say in Hebrew, Haman. Okay? the son of Hamadatta, the Agagite. Mm -hmm. Now, we're introduced to this personality, and we'll learn later on that this man, Haman, is a powerful person becoming even more powerful. Mm -hmm. And he's using his power, and this is 
coming from the fact that he is an Agagite, in other words, he is related to Agag, the king, and we heard about him back in the book, in the, in, back in the book of Samuel 1, mm -hmm. regarding King Saul. Okay? Saul had the opportunity to, when he captured and destroyed the Amalekite nation, and he's sitting there with the king Agag. He has the opportunity and is should have been, as he was commanded, to kill him. Mm -hmm. Doesn't. Samuel the prophet, of course, rebukes him for this. And he lost his kingdom. And he lost his, loses his kingdom. I mean, big, big time, big time. So look at this. This guy, Haman, I mean, Ag Agagite may be chopped into pieces, mm -hmm. but here's his descendant. No accident, by the way, that the leading Jew mm -hmm. is Mordechai. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned, he's from the tribe of Benjamin. And so, uh, Saul was from the tribe of Benjamin. So isn't that so something? So we go back like a few... Hundreds of years later, this story is now resurfacing because it did not get resolved back in the time of the kingship of King Saul. Mm -hmm. See? We're working in God's calendar. <laughs> so if something is not resolved, it's, it will come sometime and has to be resolved. It's got to be resolved. It's going to come up at another point in time. Okay? We don't know when. Okay? Uh, you know, we can get some clues by reading the book. I have a very dear friend who, who says he doesn't, you know, doesn't bother with the news, uh, doesn't bother with CNN or Fox or BBC. Um, what he does is uh, he says every, every now and then we just need to pick up the book, pick up the Bible and see how we're doing. Let's see how we're doing. True. Haman, it's true. Mm -hmm. Except for, of course, the uh, end of days show. You should be checking in with that as often <laughs> as possible. Okay. Um, Haman. Mm -hmm. And we have an idea that in order to understand mm -hmm. the deep, deep, deep idea of a word, we need to go back to the first time it's mentioned in the Bible. Now, I want to be clear. The Bible is not a history book. Okay? It's a huge mistake, and we see this among the acad you know, academics, the secular academics, and they want to figure it all out, and then, then they bring archaeology in to prove it. and that's, It's all very cute and nice, and when and when archaeologists do find something that supports the biblical account, yeah, that's, that's fun. Mm -hmm. I don't need that. I don't need historical proof. The Word of God is not a history book. But we do want to go back to the first time because God presents the book in order. Okay, in order. Genesis comes before Exodus. Exodus comes before, right? So there's an order. In order to understand where Haman is coming from, we need to go back to the very, very first time that he's mentioned. Okay, so let's go back. Genesis. Okay. That's pretty back, or pretty front, however you want to look at it. And sure enough, the very first time we come across the name or the word Haman mm -hmm. is chapter 3, book of Genesis, chapter 3, and it's going to be verse 11. It's going to be verse 11. Now, when I first read this, it's going to sound a little um, cryptic. And then I'm going to give some background so we'll be able to unfold it. So I really, let's take a look at that. In chapter 11, okay, Adam and Eve are in the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. And God is walking in the garden. And he's, uh, he talks to them. And he asks them the question in English. We say, ha have you eaten of the tree? That's the tree that right, that, that they were commanded not to eat from. Yeah. And then the Hebrew, sure enough, we see, Vayomer, now listen for the word, listen for the word Haman, you ready, you're listening? Vayomer. Uh, then he said, Mi yigid lecha, who said, who told you, ki, arum, ki arumata, that you are, uh, that you are naked. And then he says, you ready for this? This is great, this is already, this is the very end of that verse. Hamin, mm -hmm. Haman, Hamin ha'etz asher tzifatcha, Hamin ha'etz, which in English, in English is, have you eaten of the tree? Have you eaten from that tree? Hamin ha'etz, but there's that word, he mem nud, and you're going to see it on the screen. Yeah. You're going to see it on the, on the screen in front of you. The root. The root. It's, actually, it's actually the word. Mm -hmm. It's not even, it's he Mem nun, Haman. So again, you can see it in your English Bible. You need to 
work and study in Hebrew. You got to see. You're not. You are absolutely not going to see it in English or French or German or Spanish or Chinese or anything else like that. The only place you're going to find it is in the Hebrew. Back in Esther again, Book of Esther, we're introduced to this evil person named Haman,、mm-hmm. spelled He Mem Nun. Let's take a look at it on the screen. And sure enough, the first time we see that group of letters,、mm-hmm. right, is back in Genesis three eleven. He Mem Nun、It、has to do with the tree. But you know what, Natalie, this is still rather confusing. And rather cryptic. So let's let's put some let's let's fill this up a little bit more, shall we? Okay. So I want to go back to when God is first coming into the garden, because、mm-hmm. without it, this question is out of context.、Mm-hmm. So therefore, let's take a look at the very first time that that God shows up in the garden. And sure enough, it's in chapter three. And just go back a couple of verses, and it's going to be it's going to be. Ten, excuse me, nine, chapter nine, excuse me, verse nine, verse nine. nine. In the English, it says, in verse nine, right after after、uh, Adam and Eve have eaten from the tree and they suddenly realize they're naked and they start realizing all sorts of things about themselves, and the Lord God called to man and said to him, "Where are you? Or where art thou?" As you would have in the more fancier English, "Where art thou? Where are you?" And he said, "I heard your voice in the garden. I was afraid, and so on and so forth." But that's the first part of the conversation. Where are you? And again, I'm sorry to say, great love for the English language. I speak it rather well. I try, anyways. I enjoy, but it's not going to help us. We need the Hebrew. And let's look at what it says in Hebrew. What does it say in Hebrew? Ayeka. Ayeka. And it's spelled as follows: Aleph, Yud, Chaf, Hey. And look at it on the screen. You'll see it in front of you. And again, I want to remind everybody that in Hebrew we're reading from right to left. So you're going to look at that as the following letters: Aleph, Yud, Chaf, Hey. It's pronounced Ayeka, which means "Where are you?" Or as a kind of a hippie rabbi、uh, teacher of mine back in the '70s used to say, "Where are you at?" Anyways,、um, where are you? God's asking. Okay, that's an interesting question. Now I'm going to do the Opposite of what we did before,、mm-hmm. when we went from Haman or Haman in Esther back to Genesis, and I'm going to go the other direction. I'm going to go in the other direction, and I want to see the next time that word ayeka is used, because maybe that's going to help me out a little bit. Maybe it's going to help me out and to understand the story a little bit more. So we go forward this time.、Mm-hmm. We go forward into the Bible, and the next time the word ayeka is used is in the Book of Lamentations. So、open up Book of Lamentations, and when we get to Book of Lamentations, chapter one, verse one, word one. In English, and this is just a background. Lamentations is written by the prophet Jeremiah.、Mm-hmm. He's Lamen- lamenting. He's lamenting. He's lamenting. He's, he's temple, crying and he's sad. It's a dirge, and in fact, when we You'll see when we when we when we sing this or we chant this on the、um, on the commemoration of the destruction of both the first and the second temple on Tisha B'Av on the ninth day of the of the Jewish calendar of Av usually takes place in the hottest of the hottest here in Israel in the summer、uh, this year in 2013 it's going to take place、uh, third week in July but usually it's somewhere between July. And into middle of August, hot, hot, hot. It's 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 a lousy time to be outside. It, it's it's a time when just very very. And he's sitting there, and he's wa- and, the, and Jerusalem has been sacked, and it's burning, and he's lamenting. He's looking at the destroyed Jerusalem. Yeah, and I think we have to say because as Christians, very often we don't understand the importance of the temple, but the importance. It was the presence of God. Yes. So he is not lamenting just for stones. He is、oh. lamenting for the presence of God who was with them, with them, and just departed. So we need to have this understanding when we speak about the temple. It's not just stones. It was a place, holy place for God. I'm glad you mentioned that. It's、yeah. so important.、Yeah. I take that for granted, and I'm glad that you mentioned that because if we're just praying over stones. Well, that would actually be considered idol worship.、Mm-hmm. That's what <laughs> I, that's what you do when you pray and you and you weep over over, right over stone, stones. 
then then your your focus is is not clear. When we when we when we cry at the Western Wall, when we pray at the Western Wall, the Kotel, we're not praying, and we and we pray in that direction. We're not praying to the wall. We're praying to what is left, the remnant that is left of the temple. And as you say, is the is the is that physical, tangible place, that bricks and mortar place where God's going to rest. It's that kissing between heaven and earth, where we can meet God. And with the destruction of the temple. The big question remains: How are we going to do this? This is a big challenge. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, it's, and this is this is what we're lamenting over. And and at the same time, the temple was a place where the Jewish people were custodians of that sacred place. Mm -hmm. And so there is a rebuking going on when the destruction of the temple takes place. It, it is as if God is rebuking the Jewish people and saying, "Hey, I came down from heaven, so to speak, as it mm -hmm. were, to meet you on earth." And you were supposed to take care, but you know what? And you know, and I know your enemies did this to you, but look into yourselves as well. So let's take a look at that. In the English, the beginning of Lamentations, oh, how the city sits solitary that was full of people. How, how has she become like a widow, right? And so on and so forth. But look at the first word, oh, how. Now, that again, English isn't going to help us. It's Eicha. Look at the, how it's spelled. Mm -hmm. Aleph, Yud, yeah. Saf, Hey. And look at that. That's the, this is the next time after... This is the name of Lamentation. Yes. This is the name of the book. Oh, we don't, man. In Hebrew, we don't call it the Book of Lamentations. That's a English or a yeah. Christian definition. Uh, we call it Sefer Eicha, or actually Megillat Eicha, because it actually comes in the form of a scroll. A scribe can write it. Okay? Megillat, the scroll of Eicha. And Eicha... Like this way. Aleph, Aleph Yod, Yod, Chaf, Hey. Which is exactly the same way as it's spelled back there in the book of Genesis. We were just there. Okay. Very nice. So let's, talk, let's take a look and see what's going on here. Exactly what are we... Le what's going on? What, are we, what, what is Jeremiah lamenting? Well... He, as you say, he's lamenting over the loss of, of the temple, which is the manifestation, the physical space where God and, is going to come down and, and meet the world, meet, meet people, and it's gone. But he's lamenting something else as well, because it's not just God decided to go on vacation, mm -hmm. okay, bye, I'll be gone for a couple thousand years, you know, don't forget to feed the cat. I mean, it doesn't work that way, okay? The Jewish nation has slipped the Jewish nation has fallen. There's no question about it. It's true that we were, we were hit hard by the enemy, in this case in the book of Jeremiah, by the Babylonians. Okay? Later, in the second temple, we were hit by the Romans. Mm -hmm. But in both cases, okay, the reason for the exile, the deeper reason for the exile, has, has to do with us. And we need to look at that. And so when Jeremiah is saying, Eichan, I'm going to read it in Hebrew, and I'm actually going to chant it the way we chant it on Tisha B'Av, and listen to the tone. It goes like this. Eicha yashva badad, hayir yibadati ma'ita, kalmana rabati begoyim sharati medinot haita lamas. You get the idea? It's a dirge. It's all done in the minor key. It's sad. We tear our clothes. We wear sackcloth. We put ashes on our eyes. We're longing. What are we longing for? Jeremiah is saying, something's wrong. Something is wrong, Jerusalem. How is it possible? He's, he, he does, he's, he's, at a loss, he's at a loss to understand. How is it possible that this place that was full of people now sits like a widow? How is it possible that you were great among the nations, the princesses, princess among provinces? Okay, how is it possible that now you're, you're weeping in the night? How is it possible that, that you've come to this? How is it possible? He can't figure it out. How? Mm -hmm. How? How is it possible? Let's go back to Genesis. Now we're going to understand what God is really asking when he's walking through the garden. Take a look. God has given everything to Adam and Eve. The Garden of Eden was supposed to be perfect. Mm -hmm. Everything was set up for them. Everything. Okay? As far as we're concerned, that was paradise right then and there. There was no reason for any redemption because it, all ha it was happening at the same time. There'd be no reason for that whatsoever. It's all happening there. That was supposed to be, 
That was supposed to be the perfection of God's creation. And Eden. what happens? He, go, he goes and he sees Adam and Eve and they have messed up. They've messed up. They've slipped. Mm -hmm. okay? Just like the Jewish nation did is good, okay? back during the destruction of the temple. And God says to them, oh, Eicha, Ayeka, Eicha, how did this happen? How did this come to be? You were supposed to live in the garden. This is supposed to be paradise. How is it possible that you took this opportunity, this great gift, this, this redemption now, and how is it possible that you spit it back? How is it possible that you treated it with such, cow, with such callousness? How is this possible? God says, I'm a la I'm, I, I have a lack. I even, you know, God is saying, I, I, I don't understand. Jeremiah picks up that terminology later on. Jerusalem, I don't understand. It wasn't supposed to be this way. I had a, there was a different plan here. And he answers it. Hamin ha'etz, haman ha'etz. Were you distracted? Were you distracted? Did you, were you, were you on, that, on the course and then got off course? Were you on the way to where you're supposed to be and then something took you away from that? Ah, now we can go back and we can understand Haman mm -hmm. in the book of Esther. We go back to Esther. And here we are introduced to Haman, We're back where we started. We're back where we started. Haman is introduced for the very first time. And with his introduction begins the downward spiral of the Persian nation, but also the threat of genocide for the Jewish nation. We don't know for 11 months, by the time the story of Purim ends, we don't know from the time of Adar, excuse me, from the time of Nisan, which is Passover, mm -hmm. to the time of Adar, that's 11 months, okay? Those are the, okay, we'll take a look, we'll take a look at, those, at, those, at those Jewish months on the mm -hmm. screen. Take a look at those months. Here they are. We don't know for 11 months from the time of of Nisan, from Passover, 11 months later, we don't really know what's going to happen. It's pure faith. We know the story does mm, end. We know the story now, but we know the story now. But when end. you're in, but when you're in it, uh -huh. you don't know. Uh -huh. And we understand that the Hamanness, the Hamanness, mm -hmm. in a sense, was the distraction. Was the distraction. We understand that Haman, if he does represent pure evil, if he is a descendant of Agag, mm -hmm. if he is from the nation of Amalek, Amalek, Amalekite, then we begin to understand what Amalek is. Amalek isn't just some nation that comes up from behind and slaughters the, the weakest and the most vulnerable in our population. That's too simple. Amalek comes along and says something much, 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 does something much, much, much graver. Amalek says, you're on the path, mm -hmm. I'm taking you off the path. And he's the one who say, like, he didn't want the hand, his hand is against the throne of God. Yes. There is a passage in yes. Exodus. Exactly. Yeah. Because we know that an enemy of the Jewish people isn't really just an enemy of the Jewish people. That's an it. enemy of the Jewish nation is an enemy of God. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah. Yes. An enemy of the Jewish people is an enemy of God. I don't know about you. I know. But let's, I bet you'd rather be on God's side. I know. <laughs> no, but say it again, because can you hear that? The enemy of the Jewish people is enemy of God. And it's so true. And as Christians, we have also a lot of redoing, like tikkun. We have to re restrict and repair things. And... I don't know how, now I think we lost our Jewish roots as Christianity right at the beginning. And we lost the way again. There's, this yeah. is the same, we lost the way. We lost the way. Yeah. So, so thankfully, thank God, mm -hmm. right, we have a way to come back. Mm -hmm. uh, Adam and Eve, those of us, well, as, as, as the descendants of Adam and Eve, we have a lot of work to do. We have a lot of work to do to get back to the garden. What's getting back to the garden? Redemption, we have a lot to do to work on ourselves. We say something very interesting. I mentioned something about Tisha B'Av, the ninth of Av, mm -hmm. as the day when we commemorate the destruction of the first and the second temple. And this always blows me away when I say the following, that the reason okay, that we don't have the third temple today mm -hmm. okay, is because 
if the third temple were built right now, it would be destroyed again because we're not yet there. We haven't figured it out yet. We have a lot of work to do. We have. Let's get back on track. We have. <laughs> we have. This is amazing because when you, I mean, like I was telling you, you started to, it's very interesting. When I hear stories of people, how they started now, I ask them very often, when did you start to go into this new thing and the Hebrew language? <clears throat> Yesterday we had a group of people from Africa and they're discovering the Hebrew language too. And it's people from all around the world. It's like this is, and it's like God's movement. It's nobody else. And, and so you were finding all the, you know, the letters and you started to do all of that. And we're starting to find our Jewish roots. And um, friends, you know, we are on the way. And, and God knows. He has his own calendar. We need to know his calendar and we know where, where to go. And uh, tikkun means that we need to correct our way. And the Hebrew language is part, is part of that. I will just remind the people, yes. it's true, we spoke about, uh, about the Hebrew language. I wrote a book two years ago and there is now the new second edition. The second edition. And... Um, is is selling more and more because wow. I think people really have more and more this they, they start to grasp that we need to go back to the Hebrew language so if you want to uh, find it you can go on our website and you can find all uh, you can start to discover the Hebrew language so thank you again uh, Rabbi Shmuel to come and to start to explain all this beautiful thing about the Torah and uh, you can see us next week. We will carry on this wonderful discovery of Amalek and the Book of Esther and everything. Shalom, shalom. Bye. You've been watching In the Last Days, a TV program with Martin and Natalie Blackham, the program that looks at Israel and the end times with teaching from a Hebraic perspective. If you would like to financially support the program or find out about conferences, meetings, or ministry products, then please contact us with the details on your screen. Visit our easy-to-use website at www.inthelastdays.com and register for our free e-newsletter. Get the latest news from Israel, product information, online video teaching, or watch today's TV program at a time that's convenient to you. Thank you again, friends and partners, for making this program possible. See you same time, same station for the next program from In the Last Days.